uh, uh, recording. Um, the topic of today is related with long-term approach to disaster, as I explained you before. So this uh, idea of uh, to see a disaster in their historical process, and at the same time, this comparative approach in studying uh, several disasters and uh, just to find uh, so sociological and historical um, uh, analysis. And uh, the title of this, uh, this today's seminar is Dealing with Disasters in Past Societies. In last decades, the study of disaster in the, in, in the past from an historical perspective has shown how these events deeply modify the political, economic, and social life of pre-industrial societies. In this seminar, we will focus on analyzing the way in which past societies have dealt with disasters. From the coexistence of multiple interpretation, for example, religious, interpretations uh, of their causes to the importance of information networks in the aftermath of the disaster or the leading role of experts in the resolution of the emergency. For that, we are very uh, honored to have uh, in the room with us uh, Dr. Maika de Kieser, uh, which is an uh, historian at the University of Leuven, and uh, her research deals with both economic, social, and ecological history in pre-modern period. Uh, she's one of the author of a very important book, uh, let's say a book reference for historians that want to study the uh, disasters in the historical perspective. The title is Disaster and History, the Vulnerability and Res Resilience in, of Past Societies, published uh, last year for the, uh, by the uh, the, I think the, the Cambridge University Press, if I, if I see right, and is a very, a book with a very uh, range of uh, a lot of case studies, uh, including Black Death, uh, the Lisbon earthquake of uh, 1755, and the Fukushima disaster. So um, it's a the first, one of the first very um, well throughout out comprehensive, comprehensive historical overview on hazards and disasters. And I think, Micah, we will uh, do something about this uh, editorial project, which was very uh, well, well done. And, uh, and uh, so that's it. I will uh, give you the micro and the floor is yours. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I will start sharing uh, my screen so I can present. There we go. So normally yeah. now everybody should be able to see it. So indeed, today I will be talking a little bit about what we have said, but I will focus particularly on well, I've contributed to the book, let's say, yeah, because the book is quite comprehensive, but I will illustrate the point that you have asked me to look at a little bit out the, the function of information, the function of expertise, and so on in dealing with uh, disasters in the past. And so um, let's say that historians should not be too proud uh, when it comes to our role in disaster studies, because pretty much the field is much older than the contribution of historians in that field, I would say. If we look at it, especially in the 50s, there was this huge spike in studies uh, relating to disasters. Why? Because of the Cold War. A lot of people started to ask questions. Uh, about, for example, how do people react to extreme events? And of course, everybody was afraid of a nuclear explosion or nuclear event, but they started to look at volcanic eruptions, wars, and things like that in order to see how do people react when they are confronted with that. But let's say that geographers and in the human uh, societies, uh, in the human um, specter of studies, sociologists, and so on, were much more in the front line pioneers in that than historians, I have to admit. Um, and if we look at it, um, a lot of it in the beginning was quite practical, was quite looking at um, 
exact responses or dealing with the aftermath. But more and more people became aware, okay, this is not enough. If we really want to be able to study how people respond, you have to take a little bit step back, take the bigger picture, and also look at societal causes. What makes people vulnerable? It's not just the disaster. It's not just the earthquake, the flood, the pandemic. It's also societies making themselves vulnerable to these kinds of extreme events. And so that became much more to the foreground um, after the initial um, focus on the disaster and the direct aftermath the, themselves. And so, for example, an iconic book in that is At Risk uh, by Wisner and Blakey. Blakey uh, and they have really stressed that importance of what makes societies actually vulnerable or at risk. Um, and they have uh, really put the society central in that respect. Um, and so this has become a very dominant perspective. Eh? The idea that there is such a thing as a natural disaster has been questioned fundamentally, that it's actually a natural phenomenon but for it to become a disaster is actually the social aspect in it. For example, Farah calls it uh, this way. Uh, what is important is actually the condition of people which makes it possible for a hazard to become a disaster, not solely the disaster in itself. Um, and without denying, of course, the significance of these natural hazards as huge triggers and as extreme events, this approach actually emphasizes the various ways in which social systems operate to generate a disaster by making people vulnerable. And so historians jumped in to that kind of debate only by the 1970s, 1980s, let's say that that, that has become, of course, there were pioneers that were earlier than that, but pretty much as a, as a dominant field, we jumped in quite late. And some were still disbelievers. For example, there is this quote, I think it was from De Vries, who said that short-term climatic crises stand in relationship to economic history as bank robberies to the history of banking. So often minimizing the influence of those disasters. And it's, it's such a short-term event, it's an anomaly, it's not really fundamental, and it cannot really steer the course of history. So at that time, it started to rise, but still it needed some time to sink in and really take hold, let's say, of the field. Currently, of course, it is a very prominent field and we have a lot of sub-disciplines, let's say. For example, the, the field of climate history, of course, deals with climate extremes and disasters, a lot of it. Um, but they have their own paradigm and they have their own questions, while socioeconomic history focuses more on the bigger theories like Marxist history, but also Malthusian questions, uh, Smithian questions, Ricardian, Ricardian questions, but also now very much focused on what is the impact of disasters, but they do ask different questions. Again, if you look at political, cultural history, more institutional history, also very important, but all of these fields sometimes do feel like they are a little bit standing next to each other rather than working together sometimes. And so while vulnerability was a very prominent concept, but also a very prominent debate from the 60s until pretty much the 80s or the 90s, Greg Bankoff, for example, uh, has, has made a very um, important point that adaptation and resilience have taken over as the dominant discourse. And you could say, okay, why is that important? Why? Because now the focus has not been that much on what makes societies vulnerable or what makes societies at risk, but more on, let's say, the positive side, on the bouncing not back, but actually bouncing forward to adapt yourself. And so the, the predominant discourse has been on how wonderfully, wonderfully uh, resilient societies have been throughout the past um, and how they could really restructure themselves, reinvent themselves, change their structures in order to become real chameleons, let's say, and restructure. And this really gave a, a, an entirely different perspective, not the gloomy one about being at risk, uh, being vulnerable, but rather as disasters 
as sometimes opportunities or a force for good. And for example, with the Lisbon earthquake in 1755, how that really gave uh, the, the minister, Pombal, the opportunity to kind of restructure society, new laws, new building codes, a new city, and revitalizing society, uh, how people have really found very inventive and very original ways of bouncing back. And that has been pretty much until now been the dominant perspective, let's say, uh, in both the fields of history as well as outside of that. And I think with our book, we want to move beyond the either or kind of vulnerability approach or resilience approach. And we want to ask a more fundamental question. Why are some societies vulnerable and others resilient? And why even within the same kind of society, are there groups that are actually resilient and others are not? Um, and well, of course, I'm only one of the authors. We all worked a little bit under the supervision of Bas van Bavel because he had a big ERC uh, project on disasters and history. Uh, but of course, Daniel Curtis, Jessica Dijkman, Matthew Hannaford, Elin van Onneker and Tim Soons do deserve all the credit for uh, writing uh, as co-authors of this book. And um, what were a couple of the main points that we started from was that societies always show both resilient and vulnerable groups. So while, for example, a society in general can bounce back or bounce forward or adapt, uh, that doesn't mean that there are no fundamental groups that actually have suffered or lagged behind or uh, suffered from impoverishment um, or uh, had to bear a lot of the costs. And so you have to look at both of those uh, perspectives, not just only on the positive side, also not only an, at the at-risk perspective, but that you really need to look at both of them at the same time. And we have really uh, try to look at causal factors of vulnerability and resilience because historians sometimes tend to look at one disaster or one event or a particular time frame and then found conclusions to explain that. But that doesn't mean that the same conclusion uh, is correct for another case. So it often makes it very difficult to project findings or to project um, conclusions of one historical case study to another one. And so we try to fundamentally compare different societies throughout time, throughout space, in order to deduct certain, yeah, let's say lessons that we can learn. What is the fundamental impact of inequality on the way people can respond? What is the impact of rigid institutions? What's the impact of scapegoating and so on? So taking a step back, looking at multiple regions or multiple time frames in order to look at that. And so, for example, one of our co-authors, uh, Tim Soons, really put forward that idea. And he has a, a brilliant article in Past and Present on resilient societies and vulnerable people, because often only the system is resilient, while certain people are vulnerable. And he really made that distinction. And he said, well, yeah, if we look at it, and a lot of the, those studies in, in the adaptation kind of strategy have looked at and have declared almost all societies resilient. Pretty much everybody bounces back in one way or another, but that doesn't mean that certain groups are able to do so and stay behind or suffer enormously. Another concept that was very important for us is that we we really consider ourselves as historians as a social science. And we want to use history as a laboratory. And this was also developed by Bas van Bavel and Daniel Curtis already in an article beforehand. And we really want to use the history because it gives us an opportunity to be in a kind of lab to say, okay, the Black Death, it occurred in pretty much the entire known world at that time from Asia to Europe. And so we have a lot of societies where we can see that the same Yersinia pestis, the same species, had a fundamental different impact and created fundamentally different responses. So what does that mean? What does do different societal structures 
choices, what's the impact thereof? And so we can really compare and look at it a little bit like experiments and to test hypotheses to see, for example, with inequality that has come back for us a lot of the times, how do different levels of inequality impact the way society can respond or actually does not respond well to certain disasters? So that's, in a nutshell, the bigger picture, let's say, where, where we fit in the bigger scheme of things in our field. And now I'm going to jump into that question of knowledge and that question of experts. And so let's say that pretty much everybody agrees <laughs> that knowledge is vital. Yeah. Whether or not we're talking about traditional environmental knowledge that people actually really do know in what kind of environment they're living, in what kind of surroundings they're living and what the risks are and how they can respond to, to save them, let's say. But also experts, especially from the 16th century onwards, you really see a group of experts developing rather than just the practical knowledge of communities and so on, often states rely more on these experts from the 16th century onwards, um, but also something like disaster memory that people um, might have uh, witnessed certain types of disasters, but if the gap becomes too big and it didn't occur for a century or something like that, sometimes the memory and therefore the information or knowledge how to cope has faded away. So all of these elements have been considered extremely important in knowing how to cope with disasters. And so a lot of the, the, the historiography in historical studies has then focused on problems with knowledge. For example, Eleonora Rowland has looked at colonial uh, environments in the Americas and seen how the loss of memory can be extremely detrimental. For example, in the colonies, especially in America, where you can see that first the Spanish, then the French, then the English have conquered a certain region, every single time it breaks the, the buildup of knowledge. So the fact that there is no traditional environmental knowledge and that they often yeah, simply refuse to listen to the local communities and always think that they know better uh, prevents the buildup of that kind of knowledge and how that really fundamentally made them vulnerable to, for example, hurricanes or floods in certain regions. Um, but also being deconnected from traditional environmental knowledge, because for example, experts claim that it no longer is relevant because now they have studied it and they have enlightened knowledge and therefore do not uh, agree with it anymore. For example, in early modern Europe, the physiocrats, um, when they came up, they really started to build university kind of knowledge, but then it clashed with traditional knowledge. And cert at certain times, it actually matched, but at other times, it created a kind of clash that was quite detrimental and then led to, um, yeah, well, a, a, a bad response, for example, to cattle plague and so on, because they simply refused to combine their knowledge together. So these kind of fields have also been quite important. Now, what I have been asking myself a lot in my research is the question whether or not knowledge is actually enough, because sometimes knowledge can build up and people have a lot of knowledge and there are experts, but that doesn't mean that people listen to them. And so when do people actually use the knowledge available and when is it not? And when, when is it not used? And when is actually prevented from being implemented? And I did that by comparing two very particular case studies. The first one was the Brecklands in uh, England. You can see it here on the map. Uh, in uh, the south of Norfolk and the north of Suffolk. And the other region is much closer to my home and it's in the Campine area in nowadays Belgium. It's in, it's in the border region between Belgium and the Netherlands today. But when I was studying it, there was no border there. Uh, it was actually just uh, a bigger part of the Duchy of Brabant. And what you can see there is that 
one of the disasters, it's a very unsexy kind of disaster, it's sand drifts. The slowest kind of disaster, nobody dies from a sand drift. You do not get caught in it because it takes decades to unfold. So not a lot of people have looked at it, uh, from especially from an historical perspective, because a lot of them study much fancier disasters, but that's what I did. And what I looked at were these Heathland kind of societies, because it's the European cover sand belt that I looked at. And in a lot of those regions, you had Heathlands. And as the picture that I show here shows, is that a lot of these Heathlands became fundamentally degraded and became a kind of barren open landscape that was very prone to uh, sand drifts. Sand drifts, a little bit like the Dust Bowl in America in the 30s, but a real fundamental problem in most of Europe in the pre-modern period in those uh, regions in the European cover sand belt. And so some of the, 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 the historical records of it were actually extremely um, negative about it. And for example, John Evelyn, who was an eyewitness in 17th century Brecklands in East Anglia, said that the traveling sands have so damaged the country, rolling from place to place, and like the sands in the deserts of Libya, quite overwhelmed some entire gentleman's estates. So, yeah, it's a very dire picture of the region, but similar pictures have been put forward by physiocrats and by elites in, in that entire cover sand belt. So, for example, Johan Picard in Drenthe in the Netherlands, uh, or the physiocrats in France or the Low Countries have done the same thing. And if we look at it, because there is now a lot of geological research into it, thanks to OSL dating, optically stimulated luminescence, we can date sand layers in dunes that are created because of those sand drifts. We looked at it and we looked at the, the time frame and how actually there were disastrous sand floods throughout uh, Europe. And there were quite a lot. Eh? It went with peaks up and down because the original idea was that it was kind of a linear uh, perspective that it became much more uh, disastrous from the late medieval period onwards because of the population rise and the commercialization, which is actually not true. It has regional divergences and variability. And so in some regions, there was a spike in, a, in certain centuries and in others, it was not. But so we found indeed several periods of serious sand floods in Europe. And who were the culprits? Well, according to a lot of those physiocrats and a lot of those elites, it were the early modern communities. And they said that it was a problem because they were not informed enough, because they actually did not rely on enough scientific knowledge about it. They managed it as commons, which is very extensive and according to them, very backward, and that they didn't have systematic conservation policies. And so they had to be replaced by new policies. Uh, so for example, in the Low Countries, it was Maria Theresia, eh, the Habsburg monarch, uh, but in a lot of other places, similar kind of elites said that they should be replaced by enlightened principles and by uh, scientific uh, conservation policies. But nevertheless, if you look at it, uh, that narrative was very strong in the 18th and in the 19th century. But actually, if we compare it throughout the European cover sand belt, some regions were actually extremely successful. So, for example, if you look at the Campine area in the Low Countries, they were actually really successful in a sustainable management of their heath heathlands. They were able to prohibit, to prevent a disastrous sand flood from pretty much 1250 onwards until 1750 onwards. So a couple of centuries of no disastrous sand floods happening, even though in the surrounding regions, multiple of them were actually being recorded. And how do we know? Well, again, a couple of OSL dating techniques that we see. And so the first one here on the left that you can see is from the 9th and the 10th century. And what you can see is a, is a deposition of more than two meters of sand in a very swift occasion. So it was a couple of decades. Well, geologically speaking, that is extremely fast. And so this was deposited on the village of Pulle. It's a small village in a campine area, but it made the it destroyed the village. They had to move. They had to pack up and leave and create a new community and, and new fields and new homes somewhere else in what is now uh, 
pillar. And so this was a real disastrous event. But the 9th, 10th century is actually the colonization period of the Campine area. A lot of these uh, clearances happened. They were experimenting with a lot of new field systems and well, they got it wrong. They seriously got it wrong, but they learned from that. They really learned the lesson that what they were doing with huge clearances, getting rid of all the forest and all the trees and therefore getting rid of windbreakers that could stop the wind and could stop the sand drifts was not a good idea. And so they fundamentally restructured their landscape and I will talk about that uh, later. And so what you see on the right hand side is a dune and a dune uh, composition of the early modern period. And first of all, you would say, yeah, but there is still a dune, sand was still drifting. So there is still a problem. Yes, a little bit, but this one was actually caught in a hedge that was built to stop sand and to actually prevent it from actually destroying uh, fields, destroying the village, and it worked. That's for one. Second of all, as you can see with uh, the layers that are indicated there, it took five centuries to actually build up an actual dune. And so most of it were just tiny, tiny, tiny layers year upon year that there was a little bit of sand building up, but not anywhere near the disastrous sand flood that had occurred in the 9th and 10th century. And then, well, there were new disastrous floods, but that was actually after 1750 when the entire agricultural system of the Campine area was turned around. Because of the physiocrats, they actually abolished the entire system and common sense won. Uh, so that is actually an entirely new period uh, where the traditional environmental knowledge that they had gathered was actually taken away. So what happened? Well, first of all, I looked at historical sources and a lot of them were bylaws. And bylaws are the written regulations of villages in early modern periods in how to deal with the environment with their fields, with their heathlands, and so on. And by looking at the bylaws, I really discovered that they had a very strong ecological awareness. They were doing much more than just looking after their resources to remain alive and, and, and staying uh, into a, a correct balance. They had an awareness that their entire society was dependent on the natural environment and that they had an influence in it. And they understood it as a very complex ecosystem. And a lot of the texts were dealing with that issue of fragility that they knew, okay, these are quartz layers and quartz layers are very fragile. And if you disturb them, they will start to drift and we will not be able to stop the drifting once it occurs. They knew it was a cascading kind of process of degradation and that they actually relied on a very balanced and a very diverse landscape in order to prevent that from happening. So they knew if we cut off too much sods, for example, in that place, and we let our sheep graze there and we dig too much peat pits here, then that all will lead to a cascading kind of process of soil degradation. And so they got that awareness. And what they did is they created rules in accordance with the carrying capacity of the landscape, which is quite impressive for these medieval and early modern communities to be able to do that. And so what did they do? And this is, for example, in the background, one of those bylaws that they made in order to regulate uh, the management of the landscape. And what they did was, first of all, very strong social control. It's very effective. I don't know whether you want to live in a kind of campaign society where everybody was watching each other 24 seven, but still it worked because everybody kept controlling other people's herds. Was the grazing capacity not too much? Were you not actually grazing in regions where you could not allow uh, your animals to graze? Were you digging sods where you were not allowed to dig sods? Were you actually uh, cutting down trees where it was not allowed? These kind of things. They appointed officials, so uh, a couple of uh, official um, specialists in the village to control the trespassing, but also to set the limits on what to use and define which is a vulnerable zone and so on. They limited the amount of resources to be harvested or used, and they prohibited the sale of explicitly the exhaustible resources, because often they say they prohibit all kinds of resources to be sold, but that's not true. They really knew, okay, peat, loam, 
were the most important things that really are exhaustible and you really ruin the landscape if you over exploit that. So they limited the sale of that. What else did they do? Well, they actively intervened in the landscape to stop sand drifts and they knew how to do it. For example, windbreakers is a very important part of it. So setting up a certain, uh, what they called heath forests, so little, little uh, bushes of, well, forests, don't imagine a, a German kind of romantic forest. It were tiny little shrubs and woodlands, uh, but they knew where to place it. They knew where to place it on the fragile dunes, in the very sandy areas, and in different locations in order to stop the wind from getting a, a velocity that was enough to create these kind of uh, sand drifts. They prohibited the grazing on certain spots, and they introduced a bocage kind of landscape. So the original 9th and 10th century, that was huge clearances with huge open landscape and open fields. And so they realized, OK, that's not smart. Let's introduce a bocage landscape with hedges around a lot of fields in order, first of all, to stop the sand from drifting from the fields to the heathlands, but also to stop sand from the heath fields to actually be deposited on the fields. And so if it did go wrong, they actively invested in the restoration and the renewal of the ecosystem. So for example, filling up the pits where they were digging peat or where they had digged uh, for sand or for loam um, and actually really uh, creating um, hedges in these strategic uh, locations. For example, the picture that you see here is called the Konijnenberg, which literally, literally translates to rabbit mountain. And that is one of those dunes that was actually caught in the woodlands that was explicitly developed in order to stop the sand from reaching the village and the productive fields. And indeed, it created a dune, but it stopped it from hindering any kind of productive land. So what you see here is a very well-developed and very special kind of buildup of traditional environmental knowledge, not by experts, but just by mere peasants, peasant communities, by centuries of trial and error, developing a system that created a congruence between the rules and the exploitation and the carrying capacity of that society. So that's a very positive story. Unfortunately, in the Bracklands, they were not that successful. And as you can see here with the bar, it was a research from me and Mark Bateman. Mark Bateman is from the geology department of the Sheffield University. And he did the OSL dating. I'm a mere historian, I'm not able to do that. And so what we discovered is that there were multiple waves of enormous disastrous events. So the, the worst one was in Santon Downham and that's the picture of the church next to that. Santon Downham was actually just plainly called Downham in the Middle Ages and the early modern period. And it's because it was flooded by sand that they called it Sandy Downham, which is now known as Santon Downham, because it was actually one of those villages that was completely destroyed. It was deserted altogether after the disastrous sand flood of 1668. And so it had to be left and it was changed into a rabbit warren and a sheep breeding field and no people left there after that uh, disaster. So really a couple of detrimental sand floods in the same period when actually in the Campine area, it went quite well. So a lot of the arguments that have been used was climate change or just more wind or storminess and that's why. But well, the climate is pretty much the same in the Campine area as it is in the Brecklands. So that's actually not an excuse. So it was mere the societal causes. And so what we see there is that all of these very smartly developed implica Im implementations that they had in the Campine area were not implemented there. They didn't have windbreakers, and there was actually a prohibition against hedges and hurdles around fields. The feudal lords, well, the manorial lords of the region actually prohibited it. But why? Because they wanted their manorial flocks of sheep to be able to roam in their entire area without any kind of hindrance and they should be able to roam also on the peasants fields and if there are hedges or if there are hurdles then there are actually limits to that and they didn't want that 
They also had a lot of free riding problems. They had actual rules on the limits of the amount of sheep. But since actually the manorial lords and their own flock masters were the ones that had an interest in increasing their herds beyond that limit, there was not really a lot of people that could stop them from doing so. Because if you're actually the monitor and the trespasser yourself, then it becomes quite difficult to, well, fine yourself. And so what they did was to create a landscape that was very suitable for their activities. And so if you know the Bracklands a little bit, it's in the 18th and 17th century, it became a landscape suited for sheep and rabbits. For example, this is a map of Methwold, and it's the Methwold Warren. It's a huge area, a huge area where they culled approximately 30,000 rabbits per year. It was a monstrous, a kind of capitalistic uh, enterprise. And the rabbits were killed for their fur, no longer for the pretty kind of fur coats, but for filth. You needed a lot of rabbits to create filth hats and filth coats. And so you needed these big, big warrants for these rabbits. And actually, rabbits enjoy sand drifts and sand dunes because these are ideal circumstances for them to burrow in. So for these kind of manorial lords, it was actually a benefit to create that kind of destroyed landscape rather than a downside. So for them, it's actually not a shortage of knowledge. They were aware of that because you can see it's in the conflicts between the manorial lords and the peasants that they actually ask for these hurdles, that they ask for windbreakers, that they ask for measures to be taken. But a lot of it, of these prevention measures, of course, are costly costly not only in money, but also in labor and in investments to create them. And for the lords, that's just a cost with no return because it prevents the roaming of sheep. And then actually when the land is considered degraded and eroded, they still could use it for their rabbit warrants. So for them, it's not a means of a, of a shortage of knowledge. It's just that they do not actually want to implement it. So to conclude, knowledge is simply not enough. You can build up knowledge and these communities in the early modern and in the uh, even medieval period actually had a lot of knowledge and traditional environmental knowledge about sand drifts, but it doesn't mean because the knowledge is available that it's implemented. Um, and so what we saw by comparing a lot of societies is that actually the implementation of knowledge is only achieved when it's in the interest of the most powerful groups in society. And once certain groups, like for example in the manorial uh, Brecklands, where the manorial lords were actually really strong and it's not in their interest, they are able to block the implementation of that knowledge. So not only is it a problem when knowledge does not build up or if there is a memory loss of disasters and so on, even when you have that, even when it has centuries to build up and the same people stay in the same place, it can still not be enough. And so what we see is that actually societal limitations are actually very detrimental when it comes to disaster responsiveness. The, the means and people willing to respond is very important. And I think that, that this gives very important lessons for today as well. When we're talking about climate change, it is a little bit like sand drift. It's something that is happening really slowly. It's not happening in one year. And people say, but we know what to do. Why, Why are we actually not responding? Well, I think lessons from the past can actually teach us something there because it doesn't mean that you have the knowledge that you'll actually implement it. Sometimes you need to actually get the means and prevent the blockage of that kind of knowledge in order to implement it. So that was in, I hope I did it in the right amount of time. Uh, and I thank you all for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Micah. Fantastic presentation.